Do you know what typhoid is? Mm. Air water disease. Yes. Yeah, it, breaks. it still breaks out today. Mm. Let's see. Well, it used to, in Victorian times, in most cities in Europe, every 25 years, there'd be an outbreak of typhoid. Mm. And it would be, a lot of people would die, you see. Now, most of those cities have got a piped water supply, but it was their habit to put the water on in the morning for a couple of hours mm. and then shut it off to protect the supply. And uh, anyway, uniquely in Nottingham, this man, Thomas Hawksley, uh, he was educated, born educated in Nottingham, and he became the city civil engineer. And he insisted that in Nottingham that people put a tap on the end of all the pipes, right? which was expensive and, 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 you know, took some force of character to insist on that. Right? And then he pressurised Nottingham's water supply 24 7. Okay? Now that meant that if there was any leakage, it would always leak out. They put the reservoir right at the highest point so that it was always pressure was always outwards. And that meant that bugs could not get into the water supply. Now, in the rest of Europe, typhoid carried on at the same level. In Nottingham, typhoid levels went down and down and down. Okay? Mm. So he proved that a healthy city needs a 24 7 pressurised water supply. Okay. Now, we've got people who've saved billions of lives, haven't we? We've got Jenner for inoculations. Mm -hmm. We've got Lister for hygiene. We've got Fleming for antibiotics. Now, uh, you could actually draw up a league table for how many lives these people have saved. Well, our friend, Thomas Hawksley, he would be in that table. Mm. He might even be at the top of that table. Right, for vicious diseases, typhoid, and this is the machine he used to do it. Mm. This is the machine that pumped water out from a subterranean sump, which was the water was that was Nottingham's built on sandstone, so the sandstone would filter the water enough to put it in the taps, you see, and um, you would just have to pump it up to a high point and then let it trickle down through Nottingham. They didn't even have to pay for coal because throughout Nottingham, people were burning coal on domestic grates, which are not efficient. And then this corporation would collect the ash and sieve it and get the clinker out of it. That would burn again in the boiler to drive this steam engine to keep everybody healthy. So our Mr. Hawksley, elsewhere in the world, our Mr. Hawksley is celebrated for his contribution, but we forget about him in this country. But industry, commerce and industry means cities. And cities means coal. That's how you heat your house in a city. And Nottingham was fortunate in the, in, in, in fact, Britain is, is fortunate in the good lot of coal. Nottingham has got a great big thick band of coal right to the surface, north to south, right through the county. Mm -hmm. And initially, all you had to do was dig bell-shaped pits to get the coal out. That, the, the Willoughby's who lived at Woolerton Hall had got coal on their land over there. They initially leased it out to coal miners. That's one of the things that helped finance Woolerton Hall, digging coal out of their land. Now, um, as things progressed, obviously, the more coal you take out, the deeper you have to go. By the 1700s, they were down 50 to 90 feet. And at that depth, the water is coming in all the time. And you've got to use manpower and horsepower to pump it out all the time. 
Okay. Now, they were obviously on for a losing battle. The deeper you went, the harder it became. So, um, something had to give. Everybody knew something had to give. Now, the first person to think that steam might be involved was this gentleman, Thomas Savory. Hmm. Now, he was a retired military engineer. And he realised if you take a strong vessel, fill it with steam, cork it up, when the steam condenses, it shrinks like a thousand fold and creates a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And a vacuum can be used to draw liquid up in tubes from below. But you can only draw water up about 25 feet. Why is that? Pressure not great enough to get any more. Hmm? Pressure not great enough to get any more. Which pressure? Vacuum. Yeah, the vacuum pressure. Okay, so you're saying there's a limit on the vacuum pressure. Mm. What is the limit? Depend on the, on the, on the, depending on how much steam pressure you've got. Mm. You're in the right area. You're in the right area. Now, suppose you and I had a tube here. Mm. And, you know, one end was in water and the other end could open, and I was to remove air from this end of the tube. Okay. Why would the water flow in at the other end? Because of the, there's a, a suction. Suction. Mm. Now, what is suction? If I had a vacuum here in my hand, suppose I had a, a chamber here with a vacuum in it, and suddenly the chamber disappeared. Obviously, something would happen, wouldn't it? Yeah. So it, so it would rush in. What would rush in? The um, atmosphere. atmosphere. Why would the atmosphere rush in? Because the pressure on the outside is bigger than... Yeah, the pressure on the outside. What does that pressure come from? Like the air. The air, yes. It's because we've got a mountain of air above our heads. The weight of air. It's the weight of air above our heads. It's atmospheric pressure. Yes. When you draw liquids up from below, what happens, you, you're, you're reducing the pressure at this end so that atmospheric pressure at the other end can push the liquid. Okay. So anyway... The typical atmospheric pressure at the surface of the Earth is approximately equivalent to 28 feet of water in a vertical tube. So if you try and draw the liquid up further than 28 feet, you're quite right, you just start to draw vacuum at the top. Mm -hmm. Well, they're already down 50 feet, so that's no good. We've got to have another idea, see? And the next man to have got so was this Thomas Newcomen. A different sort of man altogether, a tradesman, already with a workshop in Devon, making shovels and spades and hammers and picks and things, right? Now, he had a different idea. Imagine that's the mine shaft there. You build an engine house at the top with a beam sticking out over the shaft and a mm. chain of rods to the bottom where you put a force pump, a pump which pushes the water out. And on the other end of the beam, remember you've got to make the beam rock. So on the other end of the beam, you attach a piston in a cylinder as big as you can make it. You fill a cylinder with steam. When the steam condenses, it shrinks. Right, that creates a vacuum and atmospheric pressure pushes down on the top of that piston, makes that beam rock. Mm -hmm. Now, the only other thing you have to know is that because steam is a gas, it's a bad conductor of heat. So the steam will just hang there for ages before it condenses. In order to make it condense in a realistic short time, you've got to splash cold water into it, cool it down. Anyway, Newcomen uh, devises this engine. It takes him decades to derive to work out how to make this engine. Make this engine. The first one was installed near Dudley in the West Midlands in 1712, I believe. Mm. Okay? Different people have different dates. Sure. Right? And it very, very rapidly, very, very rapidly was expanded. I think by, by 17, I think 1723, no, 1733, I think 1733, there were a hundred installed, but they were, they were actually only installed at mines. Because the thing about the Newcomen engine is it was inefficient. You've got a big iron cylinder, and one moment you're pumping hot steam into it, and the next minute you're splashing cold water into it. See? So you're wasting a lot of energy that way. So obviously it's a coal mine, the cheap, the, the coal's inexpensive. Now the only exception is the tin mine, because a tin mine is often on the coast in Cornwall. 
so you could bring a barge full of coal right onto the beach. The roads at the time were very poor, so moving the coal on the roads for, you know, for industrial purposes was really no starter. Now, the Newcomen engine, I say, the Newcomen engine was an instant success. Right. Even though it was, they were very expensive to build. I think they cost a thousand pounds to build when a typical labourer's wage was a pound a week. But because the problem with water was so severe, people would, were willing, our mine owners were willing to invest readily into the Newcomen engine, which wasn't the case of the next, the next type of engine. Now, who is the person that you associate most with steam? James Watt and Matthew Bolton. Spot on, spot on. Very good. Very few people know that, especially the Matthew Bolton connection. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. So you know the whole story. Yeah, I've, I've worked with Steam for about nine years now, eight nine years in, in Darlington. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. With a beam engine, but just a bit big, bigger than this one. Yeah. Right. Well, James Watt was a technician at Glasgow University, mm -hmm. and they had a model of a Newcomen engine for teaching purposes, and they passed it down to him to get it working better. And he worked on it for a short while, and God bless him, he's got more idea of thermodynamics than those professors in the rooms above. <laughs> and he came up with something that made the, the he, he came up with an addition which made the steam engine three times as efficient. Initially, three times as efficient, and ultimately six or seven times as efficient. What did he come up with? Is it a separate condenser? You see that steam pipe down there? Yep. You see that bulbous chamber mm -hmm. in a tank of cold water? See mm -hmm. the bulbous chamber down there in a tank of water? Yeah. yeah. Inside that chamber, there's a brass cone with cold water dripping on it. It splashes in all directions to make little droplets. That makes the steam condense. That yeah. creates the vacuum. A true James Watt steam engine derives all its energy from that vacuum. Mm. The boiler is just a kettle. Mm -hmm. No special high pressure boiler technology needed. Mm -hmm. Just a kettle. Mm -hmm. Right. As I say, it was initially three times as efficient as an open mm. engine. Now, whilst this engine was being developed, Richard Arkwright had stumbled across a way of spinning cotton to make it strong enough. Because cotton has got a short fibre. It's very hard to spin it to make it strong. Mm -hmm. But of course, cotton, we're all wearing cotton today. Cotton's much, much to be preferred from wool. Okay. In addition, you can only shear the sheep once a year and you can only have so many sheep on the land. So wool is in a limited supply. Whereas cotton is grown on the vast dry plains in India and Africa, and in particular the USA. Right? It's available in much larger quantities. Now, after Arkwright came to Nottingham, first of all, with a horse-driven machine, which was not successful. Most horse-driven machines were problematic. Right? He met a man from Derby who helped him raise the capital to go to Cromford near Matlock, where he set up um, a mill. And Arkwright, at that location, Arkwright is credited with pioneering the factory system with, you know, using low-skilled labour, mechanising each process, running, uh, running a system of, uh, you know, running to time rather than, you know, having, a, having regular shifts of, of things like that, paying regular wages. Anyway, so, so uh, Arkwright, what, the spinning of cotton opened up a whole new market. Suddenly, uh, uh, textiles could be much more affordable. Right. Originally, Arkwright's machine was called a water frame because it was always run by a water wheel. Right. Now, and um, in the late summer, the water would run low and they would employ a James Watt steam engine merely to pump the water back upstream and put it through the water wheel again. And then Matthew Barton, James Watt's business partner, insisted they put a crank on a steam engine to make a true mill engine. That meant that mills could be built in many more locations across England. That was called an amplifying factor. 
to the Industrial Revolution. So this museum illustrates the evolution of the mill engine quite nicely, if you follow me. Look at this one here in red and, and green. The first idea was to lay it out horizontally, which, as you can see, uses a lot of floor space and it needs this big flywheel to have a pit. So that's clumsy. We can do better than that. So we move on. Now look at this machine here. We've gone vertical. It uses a lot less floor space. Notice the name, Changi of Birmingham. Have you been to Birmingham? A long time ago. Have you been to the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery? Can you imagine how big it is? Yeah. They paid for it, right? They were so successful, they paid for it. Yeah. Now, if things hadn't changed, if something else hadn't come along, we'd still be using these engines today. That is a well-designed engine, perfectly fit for purpose. But notice it has an open crankshaft and it relies on oil cups. So between shifts, this has to be stationary and someone has to unscrew those oil cups and put a bit more oil in. That's the only disadvantage. Now in the 1880s, things did change. In America, somebody called Thomas Edison devised a practical... The um, light bulb, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You knew that, didn't you? I did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, the light bulb changed a, a lot of things. The light, electric lighting was so much cleaner and safer than gas lighting, it caught on very rapidly, particularly for manufacturing and retail and for street lighting. But electricity is like a 24-7 commodity. It doesn't blink on and off every shift. So you need a different sort of steam engine. And this blue one here is such a steam engine. If you'd like to look at it. Notice it has this big box there. What is that called? A uh, crankcase. That's it. It has a crankcase. So we can deliver the oil under pressure to all the bearings. We can catch it in the crankcase, filter it and pump it round again. So this engine can run for months without needing to stop. Now you'll notice it's connected to a generator, but it's not an AC generator, not alternating current like we use today. It's a direct current generator. See? Direct current like you have in your car or in a, in a battery in a torch. See? Now there's a disadvantage in a way with DC. Now Edison would supply what's called a turnkey system to a city. He'd supply the, the, the generator and he'd supply the wiring and he'd provide the street fittings to a city. Um, Ed, Edison it insisted on direct current. Right? The, the reason for this is unclear, but it could be that Edison wanted to stabilise the voltage using batteries. Because there's nothing worse with a filament light bulb uh, than a surge of voltage. You know, it'll pop the whole network. Okay. Now the disadvantage with direct current is that the whole network is at the same voltage. That means that all currents add towards the centre. And from a practical point of view, in order to build a network, a DC network, the generator has got to be in the city centre. So all that smoke and ash it's got to be in the city centre. Are you from Nottingham? No. Yep. Well, so, so, okay. so that's the that's the situation we were at. Most cities were buying a direct current system. Most cities were putting one of these big steam engines into, into the city centre. Right. Now we've got to put a pause on it there. We've got to step sideways mm -hmm. and look at the way that steam engines were being used elsewhere. Because of course steam engines were being used at sea as well. And if you step this way,
Now, at sea, a ship has to be long and thin, and the centre of gravity has to be low. So that determines, to some extent, the design of the steam engine. If you look at this one here, you see how the cylinders rock. Mm -hmm. That makes the connecting rod as short as it possibly can be. That shrinks the whole thing in this direction. So this can fit in the bottom of a ship, driving the propeller shaft in that direction. Okay. But this was the direction it was going at sea. Now, I'm going to introduce that to you. I'm going to take you around and show you the, the turbine on the other side. Now remember, for use at sea, you wanted the machine to be what's in there. There are lots of propeller blades, some rotating and some fixed. So the steam kind of zigzags its way through this structure. Now in that way, it imparts most of its energy to the rotor. Right? Previously, people had tried to make a turbine with one big wheel. But that could not be made efficient. This was reasonably efficient. Okay. Now initially, he designed this turbine for use at sea. Because it's long and thin, he built a very long, thin launch that turned out to be faster than anything the Royal Navy had got. And that launch is still in preservation in Newcastle, you can go and look at it today. Uh, the turbine found acceptance, first of all, for warships. Because it's more compact, it left more room for fuel and ammunition. Secondly, it found acceptance in ocean liners, because without large reciprocating parts, the low frequency vibration was less, and it gave the, co the passengers a more comfortable journey. The poor old tramp steamer remained using piston engines, because piston engines were easier to make. These turbine blades are quite hard to machine. So, and the, uh, what's called a triple expansion steam engine was about as efficient as a general purpose turbine anyway. So they were content to stay with pistons until they went over to diesel engines. Now, in America, Thomas Edison had got a rival. His name was Westinghouse. Right? Westinghouse companies still exist to this day. If you buy a fridge or a washing machine in, uh, in the USA today, it might well be a Westinghouse brand. See? Now, Westinghouse made his first fortune devising air brakes for trains. Mm. Are you aware when you get on a train that there are pipes connecting each carriage? Yep. Right, well, those, those pipes have to have a vacuum in them before that carriage can move. And if the carriage was to break away, it would break the tube, break the vacuum, and the carriage would just come to a gentle standstill. Okay? Much safer than what happened before to this day. Anyway, our friend Westinghouse wanted to get into the electricity business. He wanted to rival Edison. So he took on, as a consultant, a man called Tesla. So we, we celebrate Tesla today with the Tesla car. He was originally from Serbia, and he was an electrical genius. In response, he, he invented the AC induction motor, which is the big industrial motor we use today. That was the last impediment and Westinghouse came up with a new system. They said, we're going to move the power station out the city centre. We're going to use turbines to drive alternators. We're going to put the alternating voltage into an electrical transformer, and we're going to step it up to extra high voltage. You, every time you double the voltage, you halve the thickness of the wires you need. Right? We're going to step it up to something like 110,000 volts, and then we're going to put it on pylons to the city where we're going to have a substation where there's another tra electrical transformer where we can step it down to a, a useful voltage again. Okay. That's the electrical distribution system we still use today. Now in addition to that I can also do steam in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Are you interested in steam in agriculture? Yeah. 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 Okay. So Thank I'll you. start all around. Things are warming up. Good. Good.
Now, before 1777, the harvest was brought in entirely by hand. And for the grain harvest, that meant, first of all, the sickle. And then it meant the crushing floor. And then it meant winnowing. What is winnowing? It's when, isn't it when they're um, like cleaning the grain? Yeah. To get rid of all like the... Chaps. Yeah, that's the one. How do they do it? I know, at the water mill, at the, at, the, at the water mill I work at, we have like a winnowing machine. Like they shake it for different grades and it catches all the grain yeah. in it. Yeah. Well, there's a bit more, a bit more, a bit more, see? Now, if you were an, a, an, a, if you go to an older farm, you'll find they've got a barn with doors on both sides. Mm -hmm. And usually a strip of concrete between the doors. Mm -hmm. And they would arrange the doors to get a through draft. Mm -hmm. And then they would roll the grain around in a basket to try and separate the husks from the seeds. And then they would throw it up in the air and the seeds would land back in the basket and the husks would drift away on the breeze and settle on the floor. Mm. So that meant at harvest time there was a lot of labour needed and some families could exist all through the year only earning cash at harvest time. But after, uh, but what happened is in 1777, a Scottish blacksmith devised a threshing machine, see, which is like the back end of a combine harvester today. Now, the, the action part of it was a mesh drum, and it had another mesh drum inside it, and both rotated. The middle one went faster than the outer one, so you would feed the straw between the two drums and it would be whipped around and the grain would be shaken out and it would pass through the sieves and then to pass through the mesh and then within the body of the machine there were sieves which were shaken by the mechanism and they were, they, they, they were on a slight slope so some things would fall through and other things would progress down and fall off the end you see in order to stop the grain out and at the end there was a fan creating a draft which would throw, blow away the husks, which would do the, the winnowing job. Cleaned grain would come out the side of the machine straight into sacks, ready to go to the miller. This was an enormous reduction in the amount of labour needed in, in the countryside. In fact, so much so that in 1820, there were food riots in cities all around Britain. But you know, that's progress for us, you see. Now, initially, these threshing machines were powered by horses. But like I say, horses driving machinery is never a good, never a very successful formula. In Cornwall, there was a gentleman who pioneered high pressure steam. Trevithick? Gentleman called Trevithick, yes. A great big mountain of a man, sir. And had a very interesting life. He, he, he actually ended up in South America helping Bolivar free Bolivia. So he's quite an adventurer. Anyway, this is Mr. Trevithick's contribution to agriculture. It's a high pressure boiler with the works on the top and wheels underneath. And it can be towed by a horse from farm to farm. Then you put a big leather belt on that flywheel and it can power the threshing machine. Okay. Now, it was only an evolutionary step to put gear wheels between the flywheel and the road wheels to create the, th the, the traction engine, which could now drag the threshing machine around as well as power it. Yeah. And the other thing you do on a farm is ploughing. Now you can't drive a big heavy thing up, like that up and down a field, but if you put a winch underneath it, if you've got a big flat field, you can put a winch underneath each traction engine and you can winch a plough backwards and forwards across the field. Now that's what these two engines are designed to do. Now, if, for most, but that was only for a few farms, most farmers still ploughed with a horse until the coming of the farm tractor. Would you like to know more about the farm tractor?